Howdy folks, how you doing today? Happy Tuesday. Alrighty. There we go, just letting that fade out here. Nice. Alright, let's give that a pause. So, we got a couple things today. Um, we're going to go over chapter 5. This is all about methods, handling exceptions, and validating data. There's actually a lot of material here in chapter 5 uh, we're going to go through. So we'll see uh, how long it takes us tonight. Um, probably will be, uh, we'll see, probably about 8.30 or so before we switch over to lab time. We'll see how well that goes. Um, it's, it's all important stuff we definitely want to get into here. Um, and then we got to talk about the lab. So I'm sorry, I haven't got a chance to get some of this other stuff graded here. Uh, my daughter ended up in the ER over the weekend, so it's been, been quite the weekend. Uh, but I'll get to Lab 3 and Project 1 hopefully tonight. Uh, things are, are going generally pretty better. Um, Monday was still a little rough, but uh, she's doing much better, thankfully. So uh, I'll work on getting those in for you. But we got to talk about the Lab for Loops here. So let's do that one first, and then we'll go switch over to the new stuff. That sound okay? Oh, one of my cats, hang on, just a second. What? That's yes, nice. Can you come say hi? Okay. She really wanted to come say hi. Sorry. Moxie, say hi. Everyone, this is Moxie. Moxie, say hi, everyone. She'll be a year old in just a couple days, actually. This but don't tell me you went out now. Just meowing and scratching to get into my office, and now she's like, okay, she just wanted to say hi. Give me one more second. Moxie Lemon said hi. Pull it back out now. Oh, wow. Alright, sorry about that. She just wanted to say hi. So, we're going to work on our shape printing nested loops with our square, rectangle, and triangle. So we start with a new project here. This was lab four here. I'm going to make sure I put this in the right folder here. So this was for 1500 winter on Tuesdays. Um, I don't think so, Lemon. Uh, actually, my wife picked Moxie. So I named Merlin, and she named Moxie. So the deal was they were going to have similar letters. I forget how it all happened. Um, but last year, um, earlier, uh, one of my, uh, the first cats we'd gotten passed. So uh, the kids had never had kittens before, so we wanted to find some kittens. And it took uh, quite a while, actually, to find kittens in the middle of the pandemic last year. So I'm right, going to close this one down. But I think uh, I think that we brought them home in April, like the end of April, because they're about ten weeks old. I think that's not about right. Eight, ten weeks old. I forget. So it's, uh, it's going by pretty quick. All right, so we're going to start with some of these stuff from the chapter four examples. So I'm just going to go out to that um, GitHub repository because I would just want to copy paste it here and not have to reinvent the wheel for Square. So we'll look at chapter four. And we'll go find that square. So with our square printing, right, we said, what size square do you want? And we printed that size square. Okay, so we need our scanner, uh, we'll call it keyboard, is a new scanner, given system.in. Okay, and all right, so we got our square here. So we want to ask them, do we want a square, rectangle, or triangle? If they don't use one of those, we need a validation loop to make sure they enter a valid shape. So before we get any of those, um, we should ask them. Oh, we got to do our import here. So it's still red. So add our import. So we'll have a string for shape here. And I'm just going to start off as like a, a nothing here. I'm going to say while my shape dot equals ignoring case square. So while it's not square, so exclamation mark equals square is not square. And it's not shape dot equals ignoring case um, triangle. Oops, equal ignoring case, triangle, right? And it's not shape equal ignoring case, a rectangle. I mean, rectangle and then triangle. Sure, we can do them in order. 
So as long as it's not square and it's not rectangle and it's not triangle, we want this loop to run. We'll say, please enter a shape. Shape to print. Rectangle, or I don't know, square, rectangle, or triangle. Square, rectangle, or triangle. And we should probably put in our commas here, just to be proper. Okay, and then we'll say shape is, what do they type in? Keyboard.next line. We'll go get that value, store it here as shape. As long as it's not square, and it's not rectangle, and it's not triangle, we'll keep on going. Right, we'll validate, make sure they enter one of those valid shapes. Then, we'll go figure out what they want. So from here, then, we can say, okay, if the shape equals ignoring case square, and we just copy that. If it is a square, then, we can go do the square stuff. She's scratching at my door again. I don't believe it. I don't believe her. Um, else if the shape equals ignoring case, a rectangle. We'll say rectangle. Now we need to do the rectangle thing. So for rectangle, we needed a length and a width. So we're going to ask for two different values here. So we're going to ask for, how about length, enter the size or the length of the rectangle to print. And then we'll do it again for width. Enter the width of the rectangle to print, and then we'll get a value for width. Now here's where we're going to do these nested loops. So before we said, for every row less than size, print a star for every column less than size. So it's a very similar loop here now, but now we're going, so the, what did we say? Was the width the number of rows or was the length the number of rows? I forget. Like, would you expect length to be, usually the longer one is length, right? But I don't know which one's which, so we'll just, we'll just pick one. So we'll do rows as length. Nope, rows as length. And we'll do columns as width then. So for every length, we'll do another row. And then for every width, we'll put a star. So if your width was five, we'll do five stars. And then we'll go to the next length, which is the next row. Right, so it's still kind of rows and columns here. We're going to have length and width. If we wanted to, we could get fancy here, and we could make um, one of them always be longer than the other. I like that. Let's be fancy. Why not? Just uh, just for fun. So we'll do width then as the short one will be, what, number of rows. How about we do width here and we do length here. And then we can say, if my width is greater than the length, let's swap them. So if the width is longer, let's make length longer. So let's make this thing longer than it is tall, right? Just for fun. This was just for fun here. So if we need to do that, then we need an int for, we'll say the old width is width. And then I can say width is equal to the length. And I can say the length equals the old width, right? To, to swap them. So I need a place to store the old one, overwrite the old one with the length and overwrite length with the old width here. That way we're always going to make sure that our triangle has less rows than columns. Right? Just for fun. So that ought to be rectangle. Let's try it. So we did square. We know square works, but we can we can try it too. And we'll try rectangle. See how that works for us. That one follow what we're doing with this? Just trying to swap these. Uh-oh. One or more problems. Don't run. Don't run. Let's see. Where's our... Where's my errors? Where'd they go? I do build. I don't see any red lines. Where's all my red lines? There's nothing. It says there's a problem. Okay, now there's no problem. Okay, I don't know. I just had to, to hit the button again, I guess. All right, so let's try a rectangle. And let's do, let's see if we can make it switch. So if we give it, you know, like five for length and 10 for width, we should now get five by 10. So 10 stars, right? Looks good by five rows. And I'm assuming that's 10. I didn't actually count. I'm, I'm going to guess that's probably 10. Okay. So that worked for rectangle. So again, we're printing here for every column. And then once that column is done, we just print an empty, this is the new line character, to go down to the next row. That's for rectangle. Right. And then we need, uh, let's, uh, let's do this one here. We'll take, oh, we need the else if. Okay. So we'll do else if I mean, it probably could just be an else at this point here because I only have the three options. But if I ever do want to go add more options, I'd have to change it here and then change this into an else if and, and do all sorts of other stuff here. So I think this might be fine the way it is. Else if it's a triangle. 
Oh, uh, one more parenthesis here. So that was not a very helpful error. So it said, it. oh, it does say a uh, parenthesis, closing parenthesis expected. I didn't read it right. Closing parenthesis, right? Because it needs to match up to this opening parenthesis. So sometimes those messages are helpful. So for a rectangle, or for a triangle, we said there's a particular pattern here. So for the first row, we print one star. The second row, we print two stars. The third row, three stars. The fourth row, four stars. The fifth row, five stars. So we're printing the same number of stars as we are our height. So we want what size triangle, or what, what height triangle, right? Height triangle. And then we'll say this is our height. So we're going to say for every row in height, now, we want to print out the height number of stars. So our loop then doesn't go off of height. Our loop is then is going to go off of row. Now the funny thing, we really need to start this one off at 1 because 0 won't be less than 0. We won't get anything. So if we start at 1 and we go less than or equal to height, we're going to get the correct values here. We're going to start row as 1, so column is less than row the first time for the 1 star row. So we're going to print the column is less than row number of stars. So when row is 1, it'll print 1 star. Then this inner loop finishes. We come back up, adds 1 to row. Row is now 2. We'll print 2 stars. Right From 0, 0 is less than 1, print a star. 1 is less than 2, print a star. we got 2 stars. Now add another row and keep on going and going and going. So we can see this pattern following here. Hey, thanks for coming along, Alan. What? Why? I'm super confused why it's doing that now. Uh, I think NetBeans just really wants me to kill it. We just need to stop using NetBeans. Let's just try a triangle. And nothing. Uh, this compile on save thing is really... Uh, I'm going to switch off of NetBeans soon. I'm gonna, it's just going to happen. Let's try it one more time. And run. I'm almost out of my coffee, but thankfully I do have the now more delicious Coke Zero. There we go, now more delicious. They changed up the recipe. My camera it won't really autofocus there. Is that, no, that's all right. Okay, triangle, triangle. What size triangle, how about 10? So one star, two stars, three stars, four stars, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten 10 stars. So this is our little triangle here. Does that follow what we're, what we're doing with this lab? So we did square, so we just need to find the relationship between the rows and the columns. There's also a fun one we could do, which is a, a, an equilateral triangle or, or a diamond shape. But those will uh, take a little bit more time. So how do, you, how do you folks feel about this one, doing our loops? Feel okay? Wasn't too bad. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Satisfying to see it run. I, and you know, it's kind of fun to print these shapes. It really is. Kind of fun. All right. Awesome. So we'll close down lab four here then. I'll go ahead and commit this to GitHub. We open up our GitHub desktop tool. We find the right repository here. This is our Tuesday night one. And here's lab four. And push. All right, so that'll be out and available for you folks uh, if you want to review any of that. Oh, uh, today was study group before class, and then tomorrow study group um, 11, uh, 12 to 1 for the, the group tutoring sessions with Mr. Tim. So definitely recommend you folks make those if you've got the time to make them. It uh, will definitely be worth your while um, and help you improve your Java skills. So the, again, the, the more practice you get, the better you're going to get at it. That, that's really the only way that you're going to get better at coding is by working on things and, and trying example projects. And you know, if something's not clear, 
uh, let's ask some questions. So I'm here to answer questions. Uh, Mr. Tim's here to answer questions in the group sessions, because I can guarantee you, if you have a question about it, someone else in the class has a question about it. So I, I love when you drop them in Discord in the class channel, because then everyone sees the question and everyone sees the answer. You want to message me, that's fine too. Uh, if you want to meet with the tutor for group sessions, you can meet with the tutors for individual sessions. Got lots of options here to help you make sure you're successful. So we are kind of flying through the, the material, but we, there's a lot of stuff to cover, and we only have 15 weeks to cover all of it. So it's it's a, a bit of a, a blast through here as we get through all these chapters. Again, we're, we're mostly skipping chapter six. We're going to talk about debugging all the way throughout. Um, there's not too much there that we need to, to focus on. Uh, we'll get through chapter seven, and then we have the midterm coming up in two weeks from today. So again, you'll have all the time for the midterm. It's not a timed exam. Um, I used to make them a timed exam, and now I just feel bad about it because, you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So um, it'll open up on 2.22, and it'll be due by 3.1. So you'll have all week to work on it, get it done, knocked out, Project 2 will be done, so you can actually have a midwinter recess, at least for this class. I can't control your other classes, but hopefully you can take a week off and not have to worry about anything for Java. Um, and then we'll come back, and then we are halfway through. We'll pick up a couple, of top, a couple more topics here. Chapter 8, we do all of Chapter 11, only a little bit of Chapter 12, like one section, just this array list section out of Chapter 12. We'll come back for Chapter 15. We don't do much of Chapter 15, uh, a little less than half of it or so for the basic file input-output operations. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that when we get there. And we'll talk a little bit about exceptions. We don't cover the whole chapter of exceptions either. And then we'll move on to Java FX at the end of March. We'll start the final project, so then you have one month to work on that final project. So we get one, two, three, four weeks, actually 28 days, I guess a little bit less, well, a February month, February sized month um, to work on that final project where we're doing Java FX. We're going to do chapter 17 and then we may or may not get through the whole chapter that night. Um, we'll finish it up and then I've got some supplemental Java FX material I want to talk about, give you some other examples, show you um, some other way, cool ways we can use Java FX and we can make our code work with it nicely. And we'll do that for two weeks. Um, Maybe not even a whole lot on the 12th. We'll have to see um, how, how it goes. So we're going to have time set aside to work on these final projects afterwards. Um, and again, ideally we're doing these in pairs. Um, and I, I would like them to happen in pairs, but if, if that doesn't work for you and, you know, I, I get it, remote's a little bit difficult for working with people and, and stuff. So uh, if you want to do it individually, uh, that's fine. I'll allow it. Not, not too big of a deal, but if you'd like to partner up with somebody, um, Now's a chance to, to get to know your classmates and figure out who you want to work on this final project with. And we'll get that knocked out the last month. On April 19th, I have no plans to talk about anything. Um, just set aside the whole four hours that night to bounce around and work with individuals or groups and figure out what's going on. Hopefully you can get it done by the 19th. Uh, it's a little bit of a stretch, but if you can get it done in those three weeks, then you don't have anything to worry about for finals aside from showing us your game. Um, so the last night here, I, I shut up finally. And then you folks have a turn to talk. Uh, so we'll get together on Zoom instead where you can take turns screen sharing. And each person or our team will play their game for us and show us this is how they designed it. This is how they built it. This is what it looks like. Take us through the game. And, and it's, it's real quick. I grade them on the spot for their features. So you say, okay, if it does this, you get the points. If it does this, you get the points. If it does this, you get the points. Uh, similar to the rubric for Project 1. Um, and then we're done. So... You know, I know it's still early February, but we're looking to uh, essentially the end of April already now as we are in week five out of 16, but, you know, we get a week off, so a 15-week course. So that, that's uh, what's on tap for the future. Probably don't need the extra caffeine, but I'm definitely dragging a little bit. I don't know if you can tell. I, th I think I'm still talking a mile a minute, but um, definitely feeling the, the tired... So these, these night classes uh, get to be a little rough sometimes. I did them all through school um, as, a, as an undergrad and graduate student. It was always night classes, but it's gotten harder, I think. All right, so let's close out Lab 4. Start a new project here for Chapter 5. Okay, and then I'll throw that up here. All right, get rid of some of that. I just got to go change the template. It's even something you can click on, too, to change. It's not the hardest thing in the world, but just got to go do it. Excuse me.
All right. So so far, as we've been learning to solve problems, right, we've we've a couple we've gotten a couple tools to use. Right. So initially, the only thing we could do is run code start to finish, top to bottom. That was it. And we said, oh, we well, can have these if statements, and you can say, okay, if some condition is true, this part of code will run. Otherwise, this other part of code will run. And then we ought to have a little bit more control there. And I said, oh, well, you know, in addition to that, now we can also do some loops. And I can repeat a bunch of code over and over as many times as I want to have happen to get certain results back out. So I keep expanding my toolkit. Um, we're going to add another tool to our toolkit here that um, has a, a couple purposes. So um, it, it's not quite necessary, uh, but it's definitely a useful tool. So there's nothing we're going to learn and do that we can't do without these tools, but using them is going to make life easier for us. And that's what we're all about. So we're looking at a way to kind of um, use this to solve problems easier, more easily. Um, so what it is is called a method. So, so far, everything we've done has been inside of this public static void main string square braces args method. So main is actually a method. So this is where Java programs start. So anytime you go run a Java program, it goes and runs the main method to start. And everything starts here in main so for when we're running our applications. So that's like the entry point or the start of Java programs. Now what we got to do is we can write our own methods. And there's a couple reasons for writing methods. Um, one reason that I, I think is probably the, the best reason for writing methods here is that it puts a name to a chunk of code to an entire block of code so we can kind of pull it out from just being this big long main method here with a bunch of lines to being separate in its own location its own little standalone grouping here so to do that outside of the curly braces we're going to come and write another method now, for most of the time, and, and until we get to the next chapter, everything is going to be public and static. So public and static are our two keywords. Uh, we'll learn more about static next chapter, but for now, don't worry too much about it. Um, and then we're going to start off with void again. Uh, we'll get to other options here instead of void for now, but for now, public static void. And then we need to give it a name. What's the name of the method here? So let's say this is print hello. So same with variable names. Starts with the lowercase letter gets uppercase letters for every next word, this camel casing here, no spaces, and then a set of parentheses, and it, its own set of curly braces. So everything inside this set of curly braces now belongs to the print hello method. So anything inside of print hello is going to run when we ask for the print hello method to run. So we can say, you know, hi there. I guess we should just say hello, right? Hello, I am a computer. It is nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Hope you are having a nice Tuesday. And probably a capital T there, right? So this block of code then, we're going to reference by name of print hello. And anytime we ask for print hello, it's going to run these three lines of code, everything inside this set of curly braces. So inside a main, then I can just say print hello. That's all it does. So let me go give that a run. Of course, the compile and save thing. One more time now. We go print hello. And we see, hello, I'm a computer. It's nice to meet you. Hope you're having a nice Tuesday. And then inside of main, we can do other things, right? If I, if I wanted to, I can make a scanner called keyboard equals a keyboard, uh, new scanner, given system.in. And then we can say, what's your name? And get their name. That was string for name. Is the keyboard.next line. Oh, string. Keyboard.next line. Don't need that one there. Uh, we want the import for scanner, though. And then we can say, hi there. Plus name. And then I can say print hello again if I wanted to. Right? Not that can be the most interesting thing, but I can. So when this runs, We'll get the print hello, the three lines. Hello, my computers. Nice to meet you. Hope you're having a nice Tuesday. What's your name? I'll say Eric. It says hi there, Eric. And then the three lines again. So the other advantage here to taking code and separating it out, putting it into these methods here, is that it's repeatable. Right? So first you get a nice name. 
for a chunk of code. And another advantage here is it's repeatable. All you have to do is ask for the method again, and the same thing will run. So again, not you know we, we can't nothing that we couldn't have done before, but we would have had this chunk of code here and this chunk of code again here. And there's a, a pretty good rule of thumb when it comes to programming, and uh, it, it's pretty simple. It's if you have the same code in your program more than once, you should feel bad about yourself. That, that's that's the rule of thumb, right? If you've got the same code more than once, you should feel bad about yourself. It's 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 a, it's a bit of a joke. Um, hopefully, hopefully you're picking up on that. I'm sorry. Um, sometimes I'm bad at jokes. It turns out. Um, that since I love telling dad jokes and, and like the silly story kind of dad jokes. Um, Every time I, I tell my wife a story, she just kind of like sits there waiting for a punchline. And then if it's not actually a joke, like it takes her a little bit. She's like, oh, it was a real story. And, and you know, it was just kept kept waiting for the, the terrible pun or something at the end. So I, I suppose it's my own fault that um, some of these things aren't obvious and, and, and jokes are, are, are hard. But, you know, we're working on it here. We're trying. Trying to trying to add a little bit of levity. So sometimes sometimes you got to have some fun. All right, so print hello, right? We can do it as many times as you want because it's repeatable. We have a nice name for the chunk of code. So those are those are two different advantages here for writing our functions. All right, so let's uh, let's take a minute here and look at our program. Um, we we did that number guessing game, right? We did that one. Is that one we did? I feel like we did that one. Let me go look back here. Let's go back to our GitHub for the class. It's 1500. Enter Tuesday. Was that lab three? Was that our number guessing game? Yeah, so our number guessing game here. Let's take a look at this one here and see. Um, we're just for, for fun here. We're going to try and change this, write it with methods instead. Here. So I'll leave all that print hello stuff, that's fine here, but we're gonna take our number guessing game and see if we can't turn this into more of a, a method here. So I don't need to redeclare scanner, that's fine. So let's have a method then that asks the user if they wanna play a game. So right now, this method here just does something and that's it. Another kind of method that you can have is something that returns a value. So like some of these methods we've been using this whole time like keyboard.nextLine is giving you back a value. It's giving you a string because we can assign what comes back from this as name. So we can write our own methods that return values. So like keyboard.nextLine returns a string. We can save it as a string. A method that is void doesn't return anything. It just does something. But if we wanted to write a method that returns a particular value here, we can do that. So let's write public static. And then you have to say the type that you're returning. So this is going to be a type of string asks the user if they want to play again. So we'll ask the user if they want to play again. It's a long name for method here, but that's, it's very descriptive of what it's doing. So we'll say, do you want to play a game? So I'm going to take this code here, I'm going to cut it out, put it into here, and then we'll say return play. So return is the keyword that returns a value. Now the downside is, it says it can't find skim symbol keyboard. Remember, Anything that's declared inside a set of curly braces is only accessible inside that set of curly braces. Just like if we had an if statement, we declared a value inside that if, it's only accessible inside the if. If you declare a variable inside a while loop, it's only accessible inside the while loop, inside that set of curly braces. So we need to make a new scanner. It's just, you know, that's okay. There's a new scanner given system.in. Not too big of a deal here. We can do that. And we just return their value. Uh, maybe play again. I don't know. Or sure, play. Uh, sure, it's just called play. Do you want to play a game? Yes or no? Ask the user if they want to play. So maybe just ask the user if they want to play. Here. Now up top, I can say my string for play is equal to ask the user if they want to play. So I don't need to use, say, keyboard.nextLine. It's, it's whatever I get back from this method here. Ask the user if they want to play. Now I have a value. Okay. Now here, let's take this, ask them for a max number. We'll take that out, and we'll turn it into a method. 
So public static, now this is an integer value we're going to return, right? So we're going to ask the user for the max value. Again, we still need another scanner. Sure, we're just going to do this a bunch. It's, it's, it's okay. We can copy paste a line and then we'll return max number. So before I had that line in, you notice there's a big red line here. It says missing return statement. If you tell Java that your method will return something, it won't let you compile if you don't have a return statement. So it needs that return statement here for it to be happy and to make that red line go away. So now we have a method, ask the user for the max value. And I can say int uh, max number, where it gets the value of, let's assign it the value of whatever comes back from, ask the user the max value. So we'll call our, our method here and give it a, a number. Okay. So far, so good. We're doing okay. Hey, how you doing, lol? SKDS Lols Kids. I don't know how to say your name. I'm sorry. Thanks for coming along. So the next piece that we have here that might be able to turn into a method is this um, ask them to guess a number. Right? And we can get a number back out. Now the problem with this is we need to know what the max number is. Right? So if I just take this this block of code here and I cut it out and we say public static int ask the user. For uh, or ask the user to guess, right? Ask them to guess here, and I paste that in here. Yeah, it's not going to work because I don't know what a max number is, right? Max number only exists inside of this function over here. Yeah, well, excellent. That that's definitely one main advantage of methods is we're going to clean up our code, make it a little easier to navigate. Oh, thanks for my phone. Sorry about that. So we have then nice little readable chunks that do one small task. Uh, so there's this idea that code should, like each method should do one thing, right? So this does one thing, this one does one thing, this one does one thing to kind of break it up. So it's a little, um, I'm gonna say easier to follow. Um, it might look a little funny, but the idea is that you don't actually need to go look at this method, ask user for the max value. You can just say, oh, it's gonna ask them for the max value and we'll assign it here. Uh, this is NetBeans, but I'm not so fond of it. Um, not, a, not a fan of JGrasp at all. Um, it does have a really pretty debugger. Uh, I think that's the, the one shining point that it has, but other than that, it's a terrible IDE. It's absolutely terrible. So if we don't know what max number is, because it's been declared somewhere else, another thing we can do with methods here is you can give methods values. So we've done that before too. So we said, hey, I want to, where do we do that one here? Um, check if something equals ignoring case given y, right? We're giving it a value here of y to see does play equal that. Um, so I've been playing around with IntelliJ, uh, the IDEA um, Java compiler or IDE, and so far it's been really nice, but I haven't finished testing with it yet and uh, I don't I haven't asked IT to install it yet on our computers so I haven't switched yet but I think that's the plan to switch soon because um, this is driving me nuts slowly <laughs> um, so this is passing a value to that method so like next line is just open and close parentheses our methods here open and close parentheses but sometimes in the parentheses you can give it something that's called an argument so I can say um, ask the user to guess and we can say int of max number so to call the method, ask the user to guess, you have to give it an integer, which we're gonna call max number inside the method. Oh, that's very cool, glad to have you along. Are you like in an AP class then, Walls kids? So if I give you the max number when I call the method, then I can use that variable inside the, the method here. Oh, very cool, yep, that's, uh, that's pretty fun. Okay, and then we can return the guess. Give it a little format. So now we can ask them to guess here. We can have an int for guess is equal to whatever we get back from ask the user to guess. But now it says, hey, method ask the user to guess in class chapter five cannot be applied to the given types. Required int found no arguments. So we can't call the method if it lists an argument here or a parameter here. 
So the, the technical term for this, um, it is a parameter when it's defined in a method. So this is the parameter max number. When you give a function a value, it is the argument you're providing. I don't know why there's a whole big distinction here. So technically max number is the argument, not a parameter, when we're giving it here inside of the main method. And down here in the method is, is the argument, I'm sorry, this is the parameter max number that we're using, not the argument. I don't know why. I don't think it actually matters. And most people know what you're talking about. But if you, if you like technical terms and that sort of thing, um, go for it. So there's our, our method now, ask the user to guess, and we are saying, you have to tell me what the max number is for me to do this. Okay, so we got that so far. And then we have too high, too low, um, and then this guess here now, we already have code for this, right? This is guess, ask the user to guess a number. So we don't need to reprint all this here, we can just say guess is ask the user to guess. So now, aha, we've saved one line of code because we don't have to repeat that here. We can just use our function here. Sure, that's fine. Excuse me. Well, now what if we wanted to um, take out this too high and too low piece here? Could we do that? We could definitely do that. So let's have, we'll cut that out here and let's add another method. Public static int um, tell, I don't know. Um, I don't know, how about display? too high or too low. Now to do this though, we need both the guess and the random number. So when you list out arguments here or parameters here, you can have more than one. So we can have an int for guess, we can have an int for random number. Now there's no rule that says these need to match what they used to be or they need to match the variables inside of main. It's just making life easier for us to copy paste. Oh, I'm sorry, this is just a void method here. There's no returning value here. We're just saying, hey, it's too high or too low. So inside of our loop, then we can display too high or too low, given the guess and the max number. I'm sorry, the random number. Uh, that would be bad. That would have been an error. So given the guess and the random number, we'll tell them too high or too low. Then we'll change guess. We're going to increase our number of guesses. Right. So we're tracking our number of guesses here. Now there is uh, one limitation of methods here. It would be really nice if we could like get the guess and also increase our number of guesses at the same time, but a method can only return one thing. So you can only return a single value at a time. Now, when we talk in chapter seven, uh, we're gonna learn there's like some, uh, some ways around this essentially, but for now, we're just gonna say, fine, we can only return one thing, we'll be sad and that's okay. So we can't increment our number of guesses and ask them to guess at the same time. So we have to do it in two different steps. It'd be nice if they could happen at the same time, uh, but for now we're not going to. Okay, and then do you want to play again? Right, we already have a method for this, right? We have our method now, ask the user if they want to play. So we can say play equals, ask if they want to play. Right? Sure. Okay. You guessed it in some number of guesses. Sure. And then have a nice day. So the main method isn't all that smaller, but now you can see um, it almost fits on one page now. So let's see. Maybe if I cut out just a little bit of those new lines here. How about some of that? Now look, we can see all of this on one line. So aside from that print hello, right, we have, okay, ask if they want to play. As long as that's a yes, ask for the max number, generate the random value, ask for them to guess a number. Remember, guess it starts at one. As long as they've not guessed it, display too high or too low. Ask for them to guess. Number of guesses goes up. Tell them they guessed it. How many guesses? Ask if they want to play, and then have a nice day. So I can see basically everything that's inside of main on one page. Now, uh, that that's uh, generally a rule of thumb is that methods should fit on one page. It's not always the case, uh, but that that's a good good goal to aim for. If you have more than one like screens worth of code for a single method, it's a it's a, a clue that your method might be doing too much. Again, what we love is for methods to do one thing. That, that's the ideal goal, but you don't have to go super crazy um, and have like 50 different methods. Like I think, so we have one, we have two, we have three, we have four, we have five different methods. Oh, print hello doesn't count. So we have four different methods for our game here. Ask users if they want to play, ask them for the max value, ask them to guess, and display too high or too low. 
This is just methods in general. Um, I mean, even for the main method, it's nice if it's relatively small. Um, main can be a little bit longer because there could be more logic there. Um, but that, that could, you know, that could happen. Or what we could do if we really wanted here to be, you know, have a lot of fun here, I can take all of this now, this entire loop here, and I'm going to cut it out, and I'm going to make another method, public static void number guessing game, and paste it all in here. So now in my main method, I can just say number guessing game. Right? And then the method number guessing game then does all of this stuff. So now my main method just says call this one. So a method can call another method. Right? So main can call number guessing game. Number guessing game can call asks the user for the max value. So methods can call methods, which can call methods, which can call methods. You can go as nuts as you want to get with this sort of thing. Um, again, th there's a, a couple design ideas um, that you want to think about. And generally, you want methods to do one thing. Right? That, that's the general rule. But sometimes, right, you know, this, this one is the entire game. So, like, that one thing is play the game. But then we can break up that step of how do you play the game into smaller steps. So there's a, a lovely technical term for this. Which is my probably my favorite technical term in all of programming. It's called functional decomposition. We're going to take a big problem and we're going to decompose it into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller functions. So it's hard to solve a big problem. So let's break it down. It's easier to solve small problems. So if I were to say, okay, just write a method that tells the user if they're too high or too low, given their guess and the random number. Okay, this is an easy problem to solve. How about ask the user to guess? That's an easy problem to solve. Ask them for the max number. And that's an easy problem to solve. We ask for some input, get the input, and return it. These are small problems, then, that are made, you know, together. We put them all together, and we can then solve the harder problem by putting all the pieces together. Like kind of building a puzzle. Right? You're, you're tackling small pieces at a time. You don't just put the, together an entire puzzle. You look at the puzzle, and you start building sections. Maybe you build the border first, and then maybe you take this uh, set of colors that looks very distinctive when you're solving a puzzle, or, you know, an actual jigsaw puzzle. Um, you find colors that match, that sort of thing. So it's just a way of breaking up a big problem and making it smaller and smaller and smaller, which is fun. Um, and plus, if you go to like a family party and you, you just throw out the term functional decomposition, you can watch people's eyes just kind of like cross and glaze over. Um, and they're like, what? And, and then it's just fun because um, people think you're a giant nerd. And you're like, oh, yeah, I was in class and I was doing all this functional decomposition and yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, definitely. Just piece together all the methods, for sure. So any any big problem, we're just going to chunk down into smaller ones. So let's uh, let's take a look here. Let's go back to D2L for a minute here. Oops, I uh, didn't have to log in. That's nice. So let's take a look at our assignment here. Now, again, none of this is something we couldn't have done without methods, but sometimes methods can make life a little easier. So let's take a look at this project here and just kind of envision what it might look like um, as methods. So I'm gonna actually start up a new project here and we'll call this um, project two. Um, so the order in Java does not matter because Java is smart enough to say, Hey, I'm going to go compile all of this. So part of the compiling process reads all of the code and you know generates and all the Java byte code. So methods can come before, can come after. It doesn't matter. Some people say put main first. Some people say put main last. Um, generally, I prefer main first because um, what I'd like to do is like see main and then kind of get a feel for what's happening outside of that. Um, and then you know, if I want to know what that method does, I can go look at that method. And you might notice over in the far left side, I've got this little uh, navigator up here. So I can just click on any of these methods and it double click them and it will jump me to the method. So I know it seems like we got a lot of code. You got like 70 something lines. You got to scroll up a lot, scroll down a lot, but you can always come over here and jump by name to find a particular method. Excuse me. So here's project two. So let's take a look. What might project two look like if we had a bunch of methods for project two, if we did that functional decomposition, right? So project two, you know, our little uh, terrible tribute to Zork is a big, pro a big problem to solve, right? Yeah, grouping by likeness and priority. Okay, yeah, that's a good way. Um, we haven't gotten to some of those other 
details necessarily, um, like in public and private stuff, but you know, we'll, get, we'll get there. So we have all sorts of stuff happening here. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we can break all of these down into smaller problems. So our first story here that tells them they woke up, asks them what they want to do. So let's write a, a method here for, um, how about we say this is um, uh, display intro story. And we have a method then, public static void display intro story. That would display the intro story. Oh, sorry, not a, not a, a semicolon. Bad habit, bad habit. Semicolon there. Again, you know, to do, do something here. Intro story. Intro story. Sure, we can do that as a method. After we display the intro story, right? We're going to say, what do you want to do? Sure. So we'll have, say how a string for their action maybe is ask the user what they want to do. Okay, so we need a function or a method here. Public static. And now if it's going to return a value, right? It's not a void. It's a returning type. We're going to return a string here. Ask the user what they want to do. So now it won't compile here because I don't have a return. So something you can do when you're just kind of thinking of methods and kind of planning what this might look like, you can just put a stub in here and just return nothing, right? And, you know, leave yourself a to-do message to do, right? I mean, it, it's, I don't think you need to tell them what here. It's just a to-do. Um, there's also a fix me. And I think, is it fix me? One of these gets like automatically highlighted. Maybe it's to do. I don't remember. Some of them get automatically highlighted. So um, I, I never like returning null just because null causes all sorts of issues. We haven't done a lot with null yet. Um, next chapter or chapter seven, we'll talk more about nulls. So I prefer just returning empty because it's not null. <laughs> um, that, that's just my preference. Yep. All right. So ask what they want to do. The game loops until they enter the secret escape word. Sure. So while action equal ignoring case, some escape word escape word and while it's not some escape word let's keep on going right that's the loop here sure okay we'll have some commands here so we need some sort of checking the commands doing a bunch of things here where you need to keep track of their energy so you know a couple other things here um if it's one we don't recognize tell them they can't do that if it's sleep something should happen so there's a couple known commands here and there's a couple direction commands that we can go do something. Yeah, equals, um, no, so it's equals ignore case is the, the function here. So we're checking if it equals another string, ignoring uppercase and lowercase, because we don't know what users are going to type in. Some people type in all caps and they're crazy. I don't know why, uh, but I've seen people do it and it drives me nuts. So, like they just turn caps lock on and they type all caps. Okay, so sure, how about um, help? Is, a, is something here, right? So maybe we have a, a function for display help. Public static void display help. You know, and then, as you know, to do, display the help message here. So we can have all sorts of different checking here, right? So if the action equal ignoring case is help, right? It's a display help. Else if, right? And they just keep on working our way down. Da 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 da. Um, Yada, 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 some other checking here. And then eventually, um, we just have an else. So if it's not help, it's not any of the other valid commands here, we'll tell them you can't do that. I don't know. And, and you know, if you just tell them you can't do that right now, it's also kind of funny because they're like, oh, maybe I can do it later. But our game's stupid and it doesn't actually track any of that. But it might be interesting. All right, so we have help. Uh, maybe sleep might do something here. If uh, the action is sleep, something else could happen here, right? Another to do, so because sleep is going to do something with energy, these sorts of things here. Um, we've got other directions they can go or have other actions, right? Fixing up their energy, sure, um, they can't do that. Keep track of the number of moves and actions they take. So we have some other things that have to happen here. Um, once they escape, tell them congratulations, it took X turns to get out of our terrible game. Excuse me. But that's essentially it here. So while this loop is done then, we tell them congrats. 
You escaped. Our terrible game. And it took you, um, you know, some number of turns to get out. So we probably need some place to track this number of turns, right? So we can have an int for number of turns. Turns, you know, starts off at zero. Sure, or maybe one, right? Every time we ask what they want to do. And then when our loop is done, right? At the end of the loop, we need to ask them, hey, what do you want to do? Ask them again. That way it's not an infinite loop. Eventually, maybe they'll guess what the secret escape word, some escape word it is, right? right some escape word, sure. Right, whatever you want it to be. So, you know, a bunch of other else ifs in here, right? All the other valid action commands and other things that have to happen. Um, there's some other, other checking that has to happen, right? Where we're saying, hey, if you have no energy, um, they're not allowed to go in a direction. The only thing they can do is sleep. So, you know, it's some other logic that has to happen here, but, you know, we can start breaking some of this up into some methods here and doing that sort of thing. So anywhere we can find that is an option, right? So any of the valid actions then, hey, if the action is go north, we can have a function for go north if you wanted. Um, you don't necessarily have to, but it just helps break things up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And then this is a little easier to follow, perhaps. Um, and really, like, all of this then could be its own function, right? Like, do the right thing or display the display the correct value. Um, the problem with that, it gets a little harder to track the energy. Right? Where their energy starts at 10 and they can't do certain things. So you could pass it as arguments, uh, but then you need to subtract energy certain places and not subtract other places. So it's a little bit tricky here. Um, so there's one other thing I want to show you then um, that you can do to sort of work around a little bit of that. It's not really a good practice, but it's okay, and it's going to get the job done for us. Um, uh, I, th I think it'll be okay. And I won't feel too bad about it here. Is when we said, when you declare a value inside a set of curly braces, it's only accessible within that set of curly braces. Um, is, did I not call it? Oh, I had number of turns here, not turns. There we go, number of turns. So the other thing you can do is, you notice there's this other set of curly braces we haven't done anything with, and like everything is inside of, this project two set of curly braces, right? This has just kind of been hanging out the whole time. You can have a variable declared at the class level. So this is a class and these are methods of the class. So the other thing we can do then is have a variable. So this is a class level variable. Um, it's accessible everywhere in the class, which is super cool, right? So we can say static int um, energy is 10. Now, everywhere inside of here, I can access energy. So I could say, hey, if, if energy is greater than 10, that's out. You do jumping jacks. Right, and it all works because energy is accessible everywhere inside the class because it's declared, um, the, it's the idea of this, we call it scope. It's at a higher scope here. So things that are inside of the class can access other things inside the class, right? We didn't declare it inside of a method. We declared it inside of the class. So we can do those sort of things like that here. Um, and maybe that might make this a little bit easier then. So like all of this could be some sort of thing here, right? Where, you know, we, we take the appropriate action and cut all that out and say, I don't know, um, check if action, I don't know, or do action. How about do action? Why not? Given the action. So we can write a method then. Public static void do action. Given a string for the action. That says, okay, if the action's this, do this, do this, do this, this. And, and here we could do something with energy, right? So energy could equal 10 when we sleep. So we're updating a class level variable here. So we're able to do that. Um, the, the other funny thing we're going to talk more about later is if you pass particular values, what happens to them when you try and change them? We haven't got to that yet. So it, it works because energy is at the class level we can change it. Um, yeah, we'll talk more about that after. So you can do this sort of thing here. Uh, hydration, thank you so much for the reminder, excellent. I'm almost out of Coke. I'm out of coffee. It's a little sad. In a stretch. Thank you, Sega. Sega kiss. 
Look at that. All right. I know I'm tempted to throw another pot on, but I, I should maybe, maybe slow down. I got to sleep at some point tonight. We'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. So that's, um, you know, one, one approach here. It's, it's black Ravens. Um, I ran, uh, actually it wasn't even this week. Was it last week? I don't remember what day it is anymore. Is it, the last week I ran um, our D and D campaign for my my my, my party, uh, some friends of my son, and um, at some point um, I was watching Critical Role and Matt Mercer had black nails and just like the whole DM vibe with the nails and the his DM screen and, and running things. It was like that looks really fun. I got to try it, and it was a lot of fun. So we, we had a lot of fun playing. Um, the party almost died. Um, just once. Uh, the, other, the other fights they did pretty well on, but uh, they, they had some poor planning on their part um, and just walked right into a, a, what should have been, like, they set up an ambush and they did not do that thing, so <laughs> uh, that, that made for an interesting fight. But Alright, um, so why don't we take a break? It's just about 7 o'clock here. I've been talking for a while. And we'll go and go from there. Does that sound okay? Yeah, so why don't we take 10? Um, we'll come back, talk more about methods here in a little bit, and then we got to talk about handling exceptions, um, which are, work out pretty well for um, when we want to convert some numbers here. And then, let's see, a little bit of validation as well. So we've done some basic validation. We're going to look again uh, a little bit more at some other loops for validation. And then we should be pretty good for the chapter, actually. So maybe we don't have to go to 8.30. We'll see how well it goes. So there's a lot to methods, right? We're just kind of scratching the surface here. We'll spend some more time talking about them. Don't worry. And then they don't go away, right? Everything we're going to do here on out uh, essentially is going to use methods. So and we're adding this as a tool to our toolkit, but it's a very common tool. It's a very useful tool because it puts a nice name to what's going on. And then we get to avoid repeated code, right? If I do the same process, ask them what they want to do, I don't have to type, type the same thing twice, which is great. Um, we could do a similar thing. So back in our number guessing game, we could have done this um, thing with number of guesses. So we could change that as well um, with a, a class level value. We could do that if we wanted to. Again, it's, it's sort of bad form, so I, I don't necessarily encourage it a lot. Um, but it's a tool. It's, it's one way to get it done. And it's not the end of the world if we use it. So all right, when I put the music back on, we'll take 10 and we'll go from there.
Hey everybody, welcome on back. Alrighty. Awesome. So we got a couple more things to tackle here. A um, couple more um, like nitpicky, finicky sort of things about methods that we want to look at. So actually, let me go commit this here before I forget. So I'm going to do it in two steps just for fun. Um, just because I, I like how it, it looks. So you can choose not to commit things when you make commits. Uh, most of the time it's not very useful, but this way I can say here's uh, chapter 5 started. That shows up as one commit, and then I can then have the project 2 starter kind of going here. 
Um, and you're welcome to use this starter if you want it. If you want to totally ignore it because you already got started on it and don't want to change all over to use methods, that's perfectly fine too. Like either way is going to work. You don't need anything from methods to make this work. Um, but if you want to kind of use this approach, go for it. So here's project two started. So when I do the solution for it next week, I'm just going to finish it from here. Um, is sort of what, what I'm going with for there. Okay. Um, All right. I see. I got those committed. All right. So okay. So now, if we go look at chapter five, um, let's see. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to comment out this number guessing game, and then the whole thing doesn't run when we run the program. So if you want to go play with it, just leave that in instead of commenting it out, and we can go from there. Okay. Um, hang on one second, sorry. Uh, the little guy's causing trouble. Okay, let me, I gotta go grab the little guy real quick. He's causing some trouble. Give me just like uh, two or three more minutes, folks. Sorry, I'll be back in just a second. We'll put some more music on real quick. Say like 7.15 or so, okay? All right, sorry about that. Little guy causing all sorts of trouble here. So we got him back in pajamas. He's uh, quite the Houdini. 
a talented little guy. All right, so a couple things we want to look at that are interesting about methods here. So this display too high or too low. Let, let's take a look at this one for a minute here. Actually, this, um, we'll leave this in for a minute. Let me comment out these maybe. Uh, so that's control slash. Um, we'll, we'll comment things or uncomment things. If you want to like comment the whole block of code at once, the shortcuts are amazing. It's under source. You can do uh, toggle comment is the control slash for that. Or you can put it in a comment block with like the slash star. You got options. But this guess here. So if I wanted to here, I could change this. And I could say, hey, guess equals 42. So every time they go to guess a number, it's always going to be 42. Isn't that going to be frustrating? Let's see. Let's see how well that works. Let's give it a quick run. And yes, let's play a game. Let's guess a number 1 to 100. Um, 50. 50, too low, 75, still too low, 100, still too low because it's 42. We're changing it behind the scenes, so I'm actually going to go stop this. So let's take a look and see what's happening here to guess. So one of the things we've done before is use the debugger, right? Where we put a breakpoint in and we watch the values of our variables. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here at line 15 and run it with debug mode. This is the line numbers with the play. This is debug mode. Get used to the debugger. It's going to be your best friend to figure out why things are doing the things that they're doing. Okay, so now a couple of these options are actually more important. We don't want to step over now because I want to step into a method. So I want to do the step into option here. That's the down arrow to step into my number guessing game. Okay, now in number guessing game, we're going to keep on going. So actually, let me, um, let's do, that is the display too high or too low. So I'm going to keep going until line 30. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here at line 30. Then we hit the continue option. So it'll just keep running until it finds the next breakpoint. And I got to switch back over to output. Yes, we want to play a game. How high of a number we want to guess? 100. Guess the number. How about 50? Okay, so now we hit line 30. Okay, so we did all those other things. We figured out the max number. So right now I can look and see the random number is 91. I can see the value of it right here, 91. I can see my guess was 50. So I'm going to step into, into the method. So now we're in display, too high or too low. Now, notice a bunch of the numbers went away. The only values you see are values that are in scope of this function, this method here. So the arguments that were passed, the parameters here, you can see, and then any class level things. So this is this static, is anything that's at the class level. Now we don't actually have a whole lot of stuff at the class level right now, so we don't see anything there. We're going to see, okay, guess changes to 42. So when I run that line, now guess is now 42. Guess is definitely lower than that, so we print too low, and then we're done. So now we come back here. Now, but if you look here, guess is still 50. Right? We just changed it to 42 inside the function, but back here now, the very next line, after that method's done, sorry, uh, methods or functions, I, um, I, I call them interchangeably. Um, the tech, I, I suppose method is more proper in Java. Um, other languages call them functions. I have no idea why. Um, so I usually just switch between the terms, method or function. We see guess is 50. So what happens is when you pass something as an argument or a value, you say, hey, function, method, here's a value here. What you're doing is you're actually giving it a copy of that value here. We're passing a, the value there. We're not saying my actual variable. So I can change it all I want here. It's not going to change the guess here in main as it was given. So you can't change these values and have them stay changed outside of the method here. So I'm not really sure where's a good place to put that. We, we can put a little note here. So the guess that was passed as the argument can't be changed as it is back in main. Uh, does that make sense? Can't be changed as it is back in main. So even though we change it here, this won't affect it, the value of guess in main. Right? It'll change it for the rest of the function, sure. And actually, I don't want to do that. I'm going to leave that commented out. Uh, but it won't affect the value back in main because it, we're, ch we're changing the value that we were given, not the actual variable guess up here. So that's one interesting thing that happens when you're passing these um, primitives. So anything that's a primitive type, any, any of our numeric values, any chars, any booleans, um, those are all passed by value. So you get a copy of them with our methods. Uh, when it comes to things that are not primitives, like a string value, you're passing what's called the reference. So you're passing the memory address of where that thing is. Now, 
the, the downside, um, you know, you, you might think that would let you do a bunch of stuff with it, but strings are considered immutable. Strings can't be changed, which is a, a funny technical thing that happens. So even if I were to give you a string value, you can't go change the value of it behind the scenes. So if we have, um, here, we'll, we'll, let's actually take this one here again. So let's uncomment these out here. And here, I'll stop all this number guessing game. We'll say, what's your name? We'll say, hi there, name. And let's make a function here to uppercase a name. So we'll have public static void upper uppercase string given a string, I don't know, value. Sure, why not? So I can take value to uppercase, right? We'll uppercase the string here. And I can say, okay, value equals that new string. Because right, remember, value dot two uppercase isn't actually going to change anything here. And then we can print out. Sure, we can print out the value. The value. So we'll print it out before and after. So here's the value before and the value after. So what's going to happen? I'm going to pass you my name here. Uh, we'll uppercase the string of name, and then we'll say hi there, name. We're going to pass the string. Now, when I go to give you a string, because this is not a primitive type, I said I'm going to pass it by reference here. So this is our objects are passed by reference, where it is in memory. So I'm telling you, hey, go to this memory address, and here's where you can find a string. So I'm not going to make a copy of the string and give you a copy. I'm going to say, oh, go look over here in memory. This is where that actually is. Okay. I can go print out the value, so I can get the value from it, right? Go get me the value that's stored in memory. And then when I say value to uppercase, um, strings are immutable. So this actually makes a new string in memory. So let me, should I put that? Maybe I should put that on a different line. Right up here. So what's going to happen here when you make a string and we tell Java, hey, I need a place to store a string. Let me get my little handy dandy pen out here. I do sometimes miss drawing on whiteboards, but having the tablet to draw on is super handy. So um, that, that's always been like something I look for when I get laptops is having that tablet to draw on. But apparently you can get like a separate drawing tablet that's not quite as nice, but it supposedly works out really well. So I don't know. So when we tell Java, hey, I want a string for name. And we'll say, hey, it equals Eric. Java says, hey, operating system, go give me some memory to store this string Eric. So that's terrible there. So your, your operating system says, oh, sure, here's a chunk of memory, like X72FB. Now remember, memory addresses are all done in hexadecimal just because. Um, there's lots of reasons we don't really care. So it says, okay, sure, I will store Eric at this memory address here. Now, the way that strings work is they are immutable. Once a string is in memory, you can't change it in place. And for lots of reasons, right? Like if you were to try and add more letters here, there's not necessarily room to add more letters here. So it, it, the logic behind it makes a lot of sense that you can't change it. Now, just changing uppercase to lowercase, it should be changeable, but because the rule is strings are immutable, you can't change them, it won't let you do it. So if you want to say, hey, instead, we're going to take uh, name dot to upper, and I want to assign it back to name. I'll say name equals name to upper, what it does is it makes a new string in memory. It says, hey, Java operating system, go give me a new place to store a string. Sure, the operating system says, sure, how about 99BA? And in there, we're going to store E-R-I-C, all uppercase. And then it says name equals this name to upper. So name to upper generates this string here. And we say name equals that. Now, name doesn't point here anymore. It says, nope, you don't look over here. Now you look over here. So name now points to a new location in memory. So what this means is when I called my function and I had my function here like uppercase, here's my two upper function given some string for name. When I called that function, I said, hey, by the way, there's a string at x72fb. You can go use it. The function says, oh, sure, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna call that name, right, is that. I'm gonna go do some stuff and then, oh, name. Now you don't point here anymore. You go point over here. It makes a new string in memory. So the original variable here of name still points to 72FB in main. In my function to upper, I repointed it, but I didn't change the value in memory. 
So it's immutable. So it's not, it wasn't given a copy, but it's still not going to change because it's going to make a new string in memory. So let's do that one in the debugger as well. So we can see name isn't going to change, and you'll see where it changes the memory address inside the function. It's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. All right, so what is your name? We'll say Eric. And now here we see name is Eric here. And then I'm going to step into my function, uppercase, and I see, okay, the value here is Eric. I'm going to step, and now it's going to change the value of Eric. Uh, can I get the, oh, where is it here? One of these, I thought one of these things did it for me. Show reference. Can I do that? Is that what I want? Nope, that was not what I wanted. Oops, sorry. Oh, there's a way to do it. I guess not. That's okay. So we're going to see it's going to change the value here to string of uppercase Eric. It's a new string in memory. Now when I come back here, name is still Eric lowercase. Right? Hasn't been changed because it's still pointed to that same location in memory. Um, what's the... Yeah, there's a way to get the memory address out. Uh, what is it here? I think it's memory address of value value dot oh what is it in here there's a way to do it I just gotta remember I guess I should go google it the hash might be hash code no it's not the hash code shoot now let me try google real quick Java get memory address of variable Oops, it helps if you can spell right. I don't know how to do it. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Maybe maybe this will let us do it here. System identity hash code. Maybe? Hmm. Just log it. Hmm. Identity hash code of the value. I think that ought to do it. Let's try it again here after we change it here. Oh, here let's change it, print it, and do it again. And we'll try it up here as well. We'll get the name of the name. Name. Okay, let's try this. This this ought to be fun. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I think there's a way to, to do the logging. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, it looks like it's getting a little choppy here. I'm sorry. Let's see if that behaves a little better now. I'm asking my computer to do too much, apparently. Poor computer. Here, let's close with uh, Word. Don't save. Okay, what's your name? Eric. All right, so let's see. What's our output here? Yeah, memory address here. So this is the identity hash code. Sure, why not? So then we'll step. The new name, uppercase. And then let's see, did we get our output here? Yep, so here is the same memory address right here. When we passed it to the function, when we went and changed it now, you'll notice it's different here. Right, so it changed the memory address of what that variable was looking at. So it didn't change what was stored in memory. Again, it's a little bit, I don't know if esoteric is the right word, um, a little bit deep. We don't care too much about it, but next chapter, or chapter 7, we're going to care about some of these things when you pass things by reference or passing by value. So passing by reference here is one thing. Passing by value is when we pass um, copies. Right? Um, so we change because as it is back in main, so uh, primitive types, primitives are passed by value as a copy. Okay? That's the big distinction. All right, so why don't we commit this here? We'll look at uh, some more fun. Did I change something in Project 2? Uh-oh. What did I do? Oh. Well, that's weird. 
I don't know what changed here. Forgot to save, maybe. Sure, why not? For project two. Okay, and then our chapter five stuff. So here's more about passing values, more about arguments. Commit and push both of those. Okay, so now the other piece we're going to look at here um, is dealing with handling exceptions. Right, so we had name here, and if we were to say like uh, string, I'm sorry, just output. Um, you know, let's do that. Let's do that first here. Why not? So this is our um, handling exceptions, which is not crashing. Huzzah! We like to not crash because um, before, if we said, "Hey, enter your favorite number," and then we said an int of the number or favorite number, right? Why not? Favorite number is going to be integer dot parse int of the keyboard dot next line. No, not that instance of. I don't know why it keeps coming up with that. Keyboard next line here. And then we can say, I don't know, we'll just say favorite number again. So if I were to give it something that's not a number, it's going to crash real hard. That's called an exception happens. Let's give it a run. All right, so if I say 10, like spelled out 10, I get exception in thread main at Java Lang number format exception. And I get the error message here for input string 10. And then you get this ugly stack trace of where it happened. And at the start of it, or the bottom of it here, is it started at your chapter5.java line 15. And there's actually a link you can click on. We'll take you right here. This is where it crashed. So in general, um, and this is another pretty good rule of thumb, crashing is bad. Right? No one likes when their program crashes. Um, and it just makes users upset, makes them talk bad about your programs. Um, for some reason, when I'm using an app on my phone and it crashes, I just get like super frustrated. Like, why is this app crashing? Um, and generally, because I know there's better ways to not crash. Um, and then it's just, they're just lazy, like for letting it crash because crashes shouldn't happen because there are ways to deal with them. Um, you know, phones are a little funny here and things lock up all the time. And I didn't buy a very expensive phone, so it's low on resources. So like, it's always slow. So maybe the crash isn't necessarily always the app's fault, but essentially it should be handled better. So what we can do if we don't want to crash we have some options here. So we know this could crash on us here. So the way to avoid a crash is we're going to use a new keyword here called try. So try says, hey, I'm going to do something that might cause an exception. And then if there's an exception, I'm going to catch it. So you catch exceptions. So we say then catch given, um, and the specific exception type is a number format exception. We'll just call exception here. And if there's an exception, hey, I'm just going to print out the exception. Uh, exception. There. Okay. So we're going to say, okay, let's try this thing here. So try is our keyword. Um, I'm going to do something that might cause an exception. Crash. And then catch here is um, maybe maybe here. I don't know, usually it's on the same line. That's kind of funny, some of these comments, but that's okay. Um, so catch the exception. If it does happen, we don't crash. Okay. So if I run this now, and I put in 10, 10, you know, spelled out T-E-N, here I get a message here, the number format exception from input string 10, because all I did was say, hey, print out the exception. Again, this is not necessarily very helpful, and we're going to look at better things in just a minute here, but notice the rest of the program keeps on running. It didn't stop running, so it doesn't hard stop, bail, you know, fail out crash. We just did something with it, so this is how we handle it. Now, this, again, is not great here, so what we want to do instead, then, is I want to say, I want to keep you inside of a loop here until we get a value that we want. So I'm going to say, hey, um, int for favorite number... Uh, we'll say it's like negative one here because I'm pretty sure no one's favorite number is negative one. And we'll say while favorite number is equal to negative one, let's keep on doing this thing. So now I don't need to tell Java if it's an int again. I can just keep on going. And then when we're done with this whole loop here now, 
Um, oops, sorry, I missed my curly brace. So as long as favorite number is negative one, let's ask them for the number. If there's an exception, print it. If it's not negative one anymore, we're good to keep going. All right, we can just keep on going. Keep on going. If it's anything other than negative one, this is false, the while loop stops, and now I can go print out their favorite number. Right, so I can try this over and over and over and over again. And maybe you don't even print that message. Uh, maybe we do something else like try again. Oops, and you know what? I missed the prompt here. Um, let me stop that a second. So we want the prompt in here as well. So enter your favorite number. It should happen inside the loop. Sorry. Right, we should say, hey, enter your favorite number first. And maybe this is a better case for a do while loop because you want to run at least once. But again, I, I hate do loops. So I think this is probably fine here. Um, and we can go from there. So let's, get, let's give this a run now. Okay. Enter your favorite number, 10. Enter your favorite number, 20. 1, 2, 3, A, B, C. How about 10? And now it'll print it back out for us. Right? It was able to continue on past that loop. So we're validating that we're getting correct numeric input here without crashing. Because previously, if they gave us some a value, we just crashed. And we said, oh, that's fine. Just We, we hope they're going to put in the right thing. Um, you can't always hope with users, because users will give you the weirdest stuff. Right? Who, who knows what they're going to give us, and you know we, we should deal with it without crashing. Um, so when you ask them to put some values in a text box somewhere, like, hey, put in your username and password, and they hit enter without putting in a password, we shouldn't crash. Right? We should tell them, hey, you need to enter a password, and, and those sorts of things. Right? Hey, the input's not good here. So we're going through and we're validating, oh, sorry, not these, um, making sure that the input is proper. So we're going to try, and then we're going to catch with these sorts of things. Um, now, the book uses this input mismatch exception or number format exception. So I, I'm i not a fan of using these scanner class methods for next int and next double. I think they cause all sorts of trouble. And, and there's reasons um, because once you read an integer or a double, you don't read the enter key. And then the next time you read next line, all you get is an enter key, which is an empty string. So uh, I'm always avoiding using those methods in scanner. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, this is this is how we check if it's parsable. There is no other option here. Oh, okay, I, I guess you could look at the string and see, like, if the string is numeric. Um, you, you have some options, I guess, um, but they're not great. Definitely not great. So, like, if you wanted to, to say, hey, let's do, this is the keyboard next line. Um, we want a string of input is that. And then we could cut out favorite number here. Then we can say, hey, favorite number is integer.parsint. Oh my goodness, integer.parsint of the input. You can do this sort of thing, but you know, in, in the meantime, input dot, you can check a couple things about it here. Mm, you know, there's some things you can do to look for matches and things, but it's not ideal. Um, you know, individual characters you can check, hey, is a character numeric or not? Uh, we don't have a great way to do that with a string as of yet, because we haven't really talked about arrays or anything. Um, so for now, I think this is the fine approach to do a try-catch. Um, well, later on, there's a couple other options we could do, but this should be okay. So this is, you know, two steps is fine. Like, it doesn't have to be two steps. It could just be all one like it was before, but there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. But we're going to catch these number format exceptions. So either double.parse double or integer.parse int will do these number format exceptions for us. And that's what we want to catch. Um, the input mismatch, again, I'm, I'm not a big fan with um, the, the scanner class. So that's the try and catch blocks for those. Um, what do we have here? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it mentioned checking for nulls. I'm, I'm fine with that. That's okay. Uh, we don't need to do that yet. Um, checking if numbers are within certain ranges we could do, which is nice. Um, we, we've, we've looked at some of that validation before. Um, yeah, I think those are all fine. Um, so you can look through the book examples. They use their future value application to, to kind of take you through and, and keep building on that um, to see what else was in there. 
So actually, we did better than I thought, folks. We got through pretty well here, um, a lot of that. Um, so a lot to do with methods. Um, this try and catch is, is just a nice thing as we're working with using these methods. Like integer.parseint integer is a method. We're handing it the input here to turn it into some value that we're signing back out. So we've been using methods all along. Like system.out.println is a method. We give it something to print, and it shows it up on the screen. So we've, we've been using them um, without necessarily understanding a lot of the magic behind the scenes. And now we're, you know, we're looking a little bit at how we can use some of that ourselves. So um, methods are great because they put a name to what's happening. They're great because we can avoid repeated code and don't have to feel bad about ourselves. Um, and then the last thing we want to look at is if we're doing something similar every time, but it's ever so slightly different, just, you know, it's operating on a different value, we could also turn that into a method with an argument or a parameter, right? I can say, hey, give me the guess in the random number, and I can do something based on those values here. So there's another opportunity there for looking at, um, you know, how can we improve our code or make it more readable, make it more efficient, um, save ourselves time, right? We want to work smarter, not harder. Um, and we should be pretty good. How are you folks feeling tonight? You doing okay so far? Cool. All right. No, no big complaints yet. So that's good. So let's take a look here at... Uh, I can discard. I didn't make any changes. I don't have anything to discard. So let's do our next lab assignment then. So this is lab five. This is methods here, as we do next week. 6 p.m. Do 10 points. Put this as a new lab grade. Five methods in the lab category. Awesome. Categories labs. Turn in a URL. Get the GitHub question link. Fifteen hundred. Right, lab five. So let's copy that invite link. Can you submit the URL to your feedback pull request? So we want to take essentially we're going to take that lab four. So starting with the lab four code, I'll expand it to include the equilateral triangle, equilateral triangle, which looks something like. Let me go, um, show you one here. Equilateral. How do we spell that? Equilateral. Yeah, there we go. Equilateral triangle. So um, if I were to say, hey, the size of seven, I'm going to have a star, and then I'm going to have three stars, and I'm going to have five stars, I'm going to have seven stars. Okay? So it's uh, always an odd number size like this, and I think I can do this preformat, and it fits better. No, uh, preform, uh, block, code block. There we go. Um, and I'll go back. Yeah, regular paragraph. So we're going to um, change it to use methods everywhere. So method for each input prompt and a method for each shape printing. Okay. Now, one thing I want to show you here, because this will save you a little bit of time. Let me open up... Um, Lab four here. When, when I mentioned if you're doing the very similar thing and the only thing that's different is like the variable you're operating on, we can might have a method here. So let me say, uh, let's add a new method here public static int um, prompt for value. So with all these different prompts here, I'm saying, hey, enter the height of a triangle, or I'm saying, enter the length of a rectangle or the width of a rectangle. I don't want a different method for each of these, right? If I don't want one for length of rectangle, I don't want one for width of rectangle, I don't want one for height of triangle, right? If the only thing that's different is the prompt here, right, we can take that as an argument. I can say, here's the prompt, and this is really for int value, maybe. Um, 
I can say, here's the prompt. And I can return integer.parseInt of the keyboard.next line. Next line. Okay, oh, we need a, the scanner, right? So we can say scanner keyboard equals a new scanner given system.in. Right? So the only thing that's different is the prompt, right? We'll take that as an argument. So now all of these here can be one function. I just say, okay, enter the height of the triangle or enter the width of the rectangle, and I can store this value back out. Does that make sense how you can use those there? So that's our, our, our hint for uh, making lab five a little easier here. Hope oh, this was a try catch. Catch, don't crash, please. So that's another way we can use methods there. Right, and here's our lab five hint. So if you want to start with mine, go for it. If you want to start with yours, go for it. Um, any way you want to go about it, perfectly fine. I'll assume you've sourced off of me. Don't don't feel like you have to go leave comments saying, hey, I found how to do this from Eric um, for those other ones, okay? Does that make sense? Um, see the hint in lab four. Yeah, we haven't done the, the character array sort of thing, uh, Barbette, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense yet. Um, but yeah, that, that's one definitely way you could you could check. Um, so probably better to do something like that because using exceptions is a little bit slower. Um, but for now, we're just going to be fine with exceptions. So after we get to that chapter, though, we'll look at how we can do that sort of thing. Uh, we got lots of fun options there. Okay. Um, so and we're going to include the equilateral triangle, which is always an odd size. So if it's even, they give you an even number. Just add one to it. Right, it's probably the easiest route here, so don't don't like bother asking them for odd numbers every time. Just add one to it. Um, we, I guess we could do a validation loop. Yeah, why not? Why not? So um, use a validation loop. Validation loop that checks or if it's even and asks them again. That's fun practice too. Okay, so we don't forget to forget loops ever. We're going to keep using loops. We're going to keep using methods, all these sorts of things here. But we want to see can we break this lab down essentially. Um, to do this step by step by step, you know, small problem by small problem by small problem, little bit by little bit by little bit, and clean it up and see how well it's going to look now um, here, okay? So that's the goal for this one. All right, and I think other than that, we're doing pretty well. Other thoughts, questions, concerns? How's it going with the Project 2? That one's due next week, along with this lab. Uh, sorry, we, we have to kind of double up because we only meet once a week. Um, ideally, you know, that, that wouldn't happen, but um, hopefully this one's short, you know, get it knocked out before the end of tonight. If you got to take off, because it's just been a long night, you know, I, I totally understand, I get it. So if you have questions, let me know. I've got office hours tomorrow afternoon, and then um, generally nothing Thursday, um, nothing planned for Friday. I should be around. If you want to make an appointment, let me know. Shoot me a couple times, that might work for you. Um, I think I've got a couple things going on. Oh, yeah, there's meetings all afternoon. That's our big meeting day. Um, and then over the weekend, again, I might be able to meet with people. Um, I, I try and make, you know, one or two if I, if I can to meet with folks over the weekend, usually after the kids are in bed. Um, and I know you folks are busy people too, so I'll do what I can. Um, but anytime you got questions, uh, feel free to uh, shoot me a message, drop it in the Discord, that sort of thing. Uh, if something specific in your code, probably better to commit it to GitHub and shoot me a link. Um, so, like, don't try and put lots of code in the, in the Discord, but just general questions about stuff. I'm happy to see them in there. Uh, we'll be working on getting this other stuff graded tonight for you, and we can go from there. How's that sound? Folks doing okay? Uh, did I lose anybody? Let's see. We still have a lot of people hanging around. It's hard to tell. Um, I, you know, I, I do one of my classes over Zoom, and I just get a bunch of black boxes, so it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but we could we could run some voice chat or something if we wanted to at, at some point. Um, I'm open to ideas. You just let me know. Let's see who's around here. Um, maybe we can go raid. I'm gonna go check out some uh, crafting. We got, uh, my buddy Boyd's doing some. Is he doing resin uh, wood cups? Oh, those are really cool looking. We can go hang out there if you want, or we can go hang out um, with a, a game designer, um, game builder. Um, she doesn't build games on stream. She just plays games, but 
Um, she's like started a little startup company that does some games. She's kind of fun to hang out with too. You got lots of options. Anybody have an opinion? You said uh, the crafting, excellent. We send you over that way. We can do that. Let me uh, copy his name here because I never spell this right. Awesome. So we'll go raid his channel. And uh, we can head over there, say hi. Uh, we'll be around in Discord to answer questions. We can hop on Zoom calls if you folks want. Just let me know what we can do tonight um, or in, in the rest of the week, okay? You folks have a good one and take care. I will see you around.